uh, good afternoon. And uh, it's me, Jonas Edom, and David Harris presenting uh, as per usual. Uh, and as you know, we like to taking the road that is perhaps less traveled. And that is what this picture also sort of shows you uh, when you have two paths, one being the more perhaps not so convenient, not so obvious. We often choose to walk that path to find our to find our undervalued, ignored, forgotten gems in global small mid cap equity markets um, as we uh, are executing on our investment process. And of course, the fund has been in sort of a soft patch now for some time. Uh, it's coming off a very strong 2023 and also the prior years, uh, the three years. Uh, prior to 23 was also were also very strong so uh, all in this is, is shaping up to be a sort of a middle year in terms of returns uh, however that has also translated into a very exciting and interesting upside to our uh, weighted price targets in the fund at almost 80 percent currently that is the biggest we've seen since the low sort of pandemic in 2020 so that's that's kind of an interesting backdrop for this presentation and we walk through the usual investment process slides as well as the operating environment and also update you on a few new investment cases as well as the the current portfolio structure so that this may be uh, old news for some of you that know the fund well but we still want to highlight and and repeat for you what skog and focus is all about and it's all about finding these gems these very undervalued equities in global small and mid cap um, up to 10 billion US dollars in market cap is our market cap for mid the mid sized companies in that respect currently we have about 85 percent in small and mid cap companies and you know we look for that 50 percent upside in two to three years time on normalized or steady state earnings basis uh, or cyclical adjusted or current consensus estimates uh, and that is no you know, it, it's 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 easy to find these equities in certain uh, parts of the equity market, but these areas always move around, and that, this this is what makes it quite interesting. And currently, we have a very interesting pipeline and see a vast uh, number of ideas coming into the fund since the discount is is excessive in in especially the cyclical parts of 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 these global small and mid cap in in global. Uh, equity markets. Often we combine our investment cases with strong balance sheets with hidden assets in in cash or property or or cross cross holdings in Japan and Korea and so on, forming these these very uh, interesting uh, vast discounts that we we are um, looking for. Yes, but if we just start with the investment process, we use these three words, all starts with C, to, to sum up what we try to do. So we look for cheapness. We are dogmatic when it comes to price. Nothing comes into the fund if we cannot see an upside of at least 50%. But cheapness is not enough. We need to be able to identify change, so catalyst that can drive a re-rating. And we do this with a high degree of, of common sense, both when it comes to our focus on, on balance sheet but especially near term cash generation ability, but also when it comes to common sense and, and risk diversification. Me and Jonas has been working together for, for quite some time now, in excess of 15 years now, I, I believe. So we have a long history together in working with this type of uh, process and we stand uh, in, in you know, a good environment to do so in Skagen, which has been devoted to value investing now in excess of 30 years. And we are, as many of you know, contrarian investors, and that means we like to go against the stream, we go our own path to find these ignored, misunderstood and highly uh, undervalued equities, forming a quite unique uh, portfolio, uh, at least we, we think so. And the contrarianism in itself, that's possible because you have the herd moving in different directions at, at any time. And for some time, this herd has been moving into the US, perhaps big tech companies and so on, but leaving a vast majority of global equity markets outside the US uh, ignored. Uh, and that's where we sort of find and look for equities currently for our portfolio. And we have a few new or actually four new investment cases we will present for you later in this presentation. 
But just to take a closer look first of what we mean when we say that we are contrarian. Of course, to a large extent, we believe that the market is, is very efficient. But for us, being contrarian is all about identifying different contrarian phenomena that constantly occur in, in global markets. And here we can take advantage of our broad and global mandate that enables us to look in different geographies and sectors and move between those constantly where we see this market inefficiencies occur. And this can be due to as simple as companies simply being misunderstood. They can be listed in one domicile but have their operations in a completely different uh, part of the world. We often see inefficiencies when it comes to smaller cap names or lower free floats, especially among small mid cap names where we see less coverage, there are less analysts looking at the name where we have an advantage as being a bottom up fundamental investors doing the work ourselves. We can take advantage of areas in the market that over time become ignored or, or even forgotten. We take advantage of temporary market dislocations and we look below the radar at situations such as spin-offs, which we will cover in a moment. Mm. But the key is to find value. Yeah, we also like to, uh, we've shown you this picture before maybe with, but for, for uh, the ones that are new to the fund, this might be interesting to see that we're also trying to map where the, where the where the equity is positioned itself in terms of that psychology in terms of profit expectations moving that psychology cycle that every stock follows and if the big tech companies especially perhaps nvidia were unstoppable at some point sooner or later expectations will go too high the stock will get torpedoed you'll have the long interest vanish it will get neglected it will be ignored at some point even forgotten and not focused upon among global investors. And at some point in that area, in the bottom of this clock, that is where we as contrarian investors often find some very interesting ideas when expectations are uh, decently depressed for a positive risk reward, basically panning out for the next two to three years time. And when this cycle turns and revision starts going higher, and the long interest general investor uh, awakens. That's when we often hit our price target and get our 50% plus return in two to three years time. Um, just to just to state where we sort of are active in this in this cycle. So this is a very useful tool tool for us in our work in our investment process. And I just want to show you these slides. We've shown this several times before, but it's always interesting an update on where we stand currently in global equity markets on value assets in general versus, versus growth assets in general. And this is a global index since 1975 when you started measuring these ratios. And effectively there's three periods, right, where value has underperformed growth uh, massively. And that is of course in the IT bubble 2000, 2001, followed by a, a huge reversal in value assets. Then we had a QE, big tech uh, era basically from 2009 and onwards, uh, where uh, essentially value had a very tough time following these big tech. That, that was when these, these complexes were formed in the US, that now again in, in phase three, the similar companies have again massively re-rated higher on the back of AI this time, which has forced these value ratio down to a level which hasn't been seen for quite some time. So an interesting time if you think about normalization in global equity markets between these two complexes. And if we move along to the next slide, you'll see that there are plenty of catalysts for this reversal to occur. Uh, we'll also take a look at the ratio between small and mid caps and global large uh, mega caps uh, in terms of that valuation gap. But everybody knows the rates are coming down. It's just a matter of which pace and how how fast it will come down. Um, the market hasn't really started to adjust valuations, especially in the cyclical areas of the equity markets, to that potential scenario. Uh, the equity markets are often one year ahead, you know, fundamental movements in a company's uh, earnings or balance sheets or leverage profiles and so on, pricing in those events very early. This has yet to be seen. So we think there's an interesting potential for uh, the, the re-rating of value being driven by uh, a higher economic um, uh, you know, activity 
an expansion that will take place from 25 and onwards uh, in different paces in different countries, but still a tailwind for for especially cyclical uh, value assets. So that that's the backdrop there. And looking at the 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 market cap of these these gigantic companies in Europe, we talk about the granolas. That's the that's the biggest stocks in the European equity markets in Novo Nordisk, LVMH, and so on, in percent of the total market cap in Europe. And that seems to have reached some sort of climax here in early 24. The same goes for the Magnificent Seven, where uh, the same climax in that sort of top was reached somewhere in, in the middle of 24, now heading, as it seems, lower, at least at this time point in time. So maybe we're finally entering uh, an era where things are getting a little bit, little bit more balanced. So that's an interesting you know, proposition to consider a global small mid cap value fund like, like Skagen Focus. And the next slide will show you the valuation gap between these mega and large caps and the small global small and mid cap companies. And that is sitting basically around uh, the levels which hasn't been seen historically ever since these indexes were launched. We've seen a little bounce, and that's especially driven in the US, um, but still a very large discount to where you usually value these companies versus the large cap, um, mega cap stocks uh, at a premium basis. Now it's actually sitting on a, a pretty decent uh, discount still. So again, an interesting backdrop for for uh, for these um, uh, for this type of fund that we're that we're running, and we also want to highlight what we talk about the magnificent gap. Um, why should we talk about the magnificent seven? Let's talk about that magnificent gap that has sort of occurred and started building around 2016, really, when these two <laughs> these two assets these two asset indexes were basically valued you know, on a familiar basis. But that gap is now, as you can see, still extremely wide. Uh, and we'll see if this also, if there's some potential here for that to normalize or at least narrow partly, which in itself would mean a, a, a very interesting backdrop for small and mid caps. So, so, so maybe that time uh, is, is, is drawing closer uh, as we speak. Yeah, maybe just one last shot before we move into the positioning of the fund. But this one looking at uh, regional valuations uh, in the world and it's a bit messy but on the orange dot you see the absolute uh, valuation on a forward PE uh, based on 20 years of, of, of data you have the absolute number in, in orange and then you have the relative scale versus its own history and of course the thing that stands out the most is the both the absolute valuation of the US market but also versus its own history and the same goes for US, even if you take away the big technology names. So from this perspective, it's uh, uh, not so strange to see a fund like ours struggling, finding new positions in the US. And this is mostly because of the excessive valuations that we see there. And you see a much larger exposure in the fund being towards emerging markets, South Korea or regions like Japan, where we see much more attractive valuations from an absolute perspective. Just to remind you how we think about valuation, it's always important to ask a value investor what they exactly mean. When we talk about value, we expect significant discounts for something to qualify into the fund. We need to be able to identify an upside of at least 50% for anything to, uh, to even qualify into the fund. We have different uh, cornerstones in our valuation process. We look at enterprise value and here we quite conservatively adjust that for pension liabilities and looking at the entire capital structure of the firm. And then we compare that to what we call the replacement value. And here, much like private equity, we ask ourselves, what would it cost to replicate the assets of the company today? And there we have the buy or build question and we get a sense of how the market is valuing the assets of the company. And then based on the asset base that the company has today, we are conservatively looking of its, to assess its normalized earnings potential over a cycle based on the assets they have today. So we, of course, would like to see companies that are able to grow significantly, but we don't want to take that into account when we do the valuation process. So we need to see an upside based on normalized earnings potential within a three-year horizon. 
and that's how we, we, we essentially think about valuation. We can also move into different types of values that we can identify. Yes, and uh, you've probably seen this one before as well, but uh, it's always good to update you on the actual uh, portfolio construction on, on these type of value buckets that we focus on. This is not the entire portfolio, it's just a selection of stocks. And you'll notice a few new positions here, for instance, in Kalmar, which we go through uh, in mean reversion, we have added uh, a Cernox as well uh, to the fund in economic return value space. Um, and also a few other assets are, are new uh, to the fund. Hyundai Mobis has been in the fund, but has been increased uh, as of late on due to higher conviction. And yes, you know, we try to diversify among these different uh, value buckets, mean reversion being one core, uh, you know, uh, part of what we look for, of course, classical mean reversion cases, but also economic return cases where returns are very high, but not priced in at the moment. Restructuring breakup value, where you have some of the part stories that can be sold and crystallized value and so on. Asset back, this is very good if you combine it special with mean reversion. That's a powerful uh, value proposition. And also discount on discount, where you have layers of different, different layers of discount in the same investment cases, often present in different holding, holding company structures. Like, for instance, Swire Pacific in China holds a number of assets which are highly discounted in itself, like for instance, Cathay Pacific, Swire Properties, and a few other assets. And then you have the discount as well in the, in the holding company. In Swire, you actually have a triple discount because there's an A share and a B share. And the, the class we hold has a, a very interesting discount to the more liquid shares. So, so that's actually a triple discount, which is quite, quite rare to, to find uh, really. But this is uh, this is just um, uh, just a summer on, on, on some of these uh, names. Yeah, and before we move on, maybe just a few words on, on portfolio construction. It's important to understand the constant flow that that's happening within the portfolio. Uh, as I hope is, is clear by now, this is a strictly price driven process. We have 35 to, to 50 positions in, in total. Currently, we have 49 positions. There's always this at least 50% upside required for anything to qualify into the fund. We cover that we are contrarian investors, so we know that timing is, of course, very difficult, which is why we scale and in slowly into the positions once this cheapness is identified, but we need to build further conviction when it comes to, to the change part, so the catalyst. And as we build conviction, we can increase the position size, and as we see diversification among catalysts, but also risk factors a position can can make itself all the way up to, to the top 10. But if a position uh, gets closer to its price target, the risk reward decreases and that, then we usually scale down and, and the positions leave the fund again through the tail. Always to have this discount attractive uh, you know, for the portfolio as a whole for our clients. We never hold anything that we believe trades at fair value. So you have this freshness of the, the fund constantly being being updated. A position can leave the fund basically for three reasons. Either it, it touches its, its price target and trades at fair value and then leaves the fund, or there's a thesis violation or new information or something develops in, uh, you know, on a path that was, was not uh, part of the investment case and then we we scale down and, and sell, or there's a duration limit. There's always uh, uh, the, the potential as a value investor to be stuck in, thing, uh, to be stuck in things that, that stay cheap for a very long time. So we have a duration limit of three years. If we don't see catalysts playing out within this time, we, we, we sell by default. Yeah, if you talk about equ equities leaving the fund, we have a few examples for you here, uh, which has been very strong this year for us. And uh, the investment case played out as we would have liked in terms of Danos leaving the fund. That's our Greek uh, domicile shipping company uh, that we sold out earlier in the year. Also, Iveco being the largest position there for a while, uh, also went very strong into our price target in, in the first part of, of the year the Italian truck maker, and also Finia, which was a spin-off from Bory Warner, uh, which we entered into in the summer of 23, 
also hit our price target um, uh, following a one year duration holding period approximately. To, it's a total of eight positions hitting our price target this year. In 23, we had 14 and 22, we had 12. So that's um, that, that's sort of what it looked like um, uh, for, for, uh, for, for this year in terms of equities hitting price targets. Thank you, on mute. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, given the, the growing interest for uh, you know adding value exposure to to portfolios and to diversify them, we've been asked a lot regarding uh, you know peer group and and positioning versus other active managers. So we reached out to a third party to help us do this analysis, and it's quite interesting uh, to see this is our fund team compared to over 330 other active global managers, and I think our focus uh, on price. Uh, does stand out. We're at the absolute bottom percentile when it comes to price to earnings. We're the absolute cheapest fund globally when it comes to, to price to book, but we're at the top percentile when it comes to dividend yield distribution, which I think reflects our focus on near term cash uh, generation ability and, and focus on, on shareholder return. So uh, it's a quite interesting there. And if you look at our exposure on a regional basis and compare it to this uh, larger peer group, it also uh, stands out quite significantly our uh, so-called on the way to the US, as we spoke about before, we struggle to find uh, cheap equities in that region at the moment. We find a lot more opportunities in countries like South Korea, uh, in Japan. We have a lot in Canada. We have a lot of, uh, of uh, commodity related names being listed in that region, part of the world. So this reflects our positioning. So in that sense, a much more diversified portfolio and very differently positioned compared to, to other peers. So if we look at 24 and the performance so far this year, uh, we mentioned a few equities that has been driving performance that is in the left of fund, that's Iveco and Finia being strong contributors. Also KB Financial, one of the largest Korean banks, the top 10 position has also uh, been strong this year. Uh, we mentioned Danos as well on the long side. Um, on, the, on the losing side, we have a few equities, Traxion being a very highly discounted Mex Mexican transportation company uh, benefiting from near shoring uh, to the US and that type of trends. Uh, a lot of that is actually uh, currency related in terms of the Mexican uh, currency being quite weak. ST Micro has been weak uh, uh, and uh, has been, we have reduced that position markedly uh, during the year since it had disappointed in terms of its, its cyclical uh, impact to, to current earnings estimates and possibly also in 25. Into four being uh, the Canadian lumber company, which we have actually increased into weakness because we st still see a very interesting risk reward, we think, in, in Inter four. And of course, we haven't really had that tailwind from AI related stocks early, uh, which most, perhaps more mainstream global equity funds did uh, enjoy in the first part of the year. So this is maybe explaining why the fund is basically flat this year in, 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 in euro terms um, as it looked uh, as the last of, of August. And looking for from the uh, what we call the big reset, i.e. when the new investment cycle started, uh, when the inflation, these bottlenecks from COVID and so on started to kick in, interest rates normalizing, a bit more volatile equity climate, which suits us quite well, uh, actually. The fund has performed very well versus all the, the, the relevant indices. Maybe the most relevant is the small mid cap index, since it's we are a small mid cap fund with over 85% exposure to small and mid caps. Uh, and also you'll see the three year and the five year basis we're doing decently versus the SMID uh, index as well. And of course, now we're having that interesting very large upside to our price targets sitting here, as we have also underperformed now for a while. So it's over, it's actually currently as we speak, over 80% upside to our weighted price targets, the highest we've seen since the pandemic lows. So this is clearly an interesting time for, uh, for the fund. Uh, 
Uh, we'll take a look at the top 10 uh, upsides uh, later in the presentation. All right, then let's move into uh, you know, some of the recent changes to the portfolio. First, we maybe just want to highlight one very interesting theme that has been uncovered in the last couple of months uh, and very important for the fund. For those of you who have followed us for, for quite some time, know that we were very engaged in the corporate uh, reform that took place and is taking place in, in Japan since 2013. And we have been capitalizing on that theme uh, over the last couple of years. It's interesting to note now that uh, Korea has been taking lessons from, from Japan and especially the, the government there has launched a number of reforms trying to address uh, this overhang on the market when it comes to the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the lower ability to, to uh, deliver shareholder returns. You have this inefficient Shabuj related structures, cross holdings, not re really, uh, you know, improving the ability to, to deliver value. There's a lot of uh, things happening there, which adds catalyst to already very attractive investment situations, which has, uh, you know, increased our conviction. So we have almost 20% of the fund as we speak uh, exposed to South Korea at the moment. Yeah, we mentioned a few uh, new positions in the fund. Um, and Kalmar uh, is a, a new position in the fund. This is a spin-off from Cargotech in Finland, which was done very recently in July 24, actually. Uh, and spin-offs are interesting since it's a new entity coming to a shareholder and they don't know it. It's a very low coverage. Uh, most people prefer to sell these stocks on the outset because they simply don't know where it is. And we think Kalmar has been through that technical selling pressure, essentially creating a very interesting uh, point of re point of inception for a large discount to fair value in Kalmar. Kalmar is actually uh, one of the leading operators of machinery equipment for container handling in ports and terminals and also within forklifts globally, uh, either one or two uh, actually position in their leading niches, also leader in, ele in electrification within these niches. So very few direct competitors actually uh, exist to, to Kalmar. And margins are cyclically depressed in 24, as you would imagine. Uh, globalization is a driving container through, throughput, is a, it's a driving sort of parameter for this company uh, globally. Uh, globalization is, we don't believe it's dead. Uh, there's a globalization 2.0 on its way. Ola Kalmar will have its role here and they recently guided for a little bit lower number than the market would have liked in 24, but we see a very decent uh, likelihood for a normalization or a mean reversion in Kalmar in 25 and 26. And it's the cheapest stocks among its peer group, despite having a depressed uh, EBIT margin of 12 to 13 percent. They might reach 15 percent according to their own targets. We also think capital allocation come coming into play. The very strong balance sheet only have about 0.5 uh, net debt to EBITDA. So we see see buybacks. We see uh, maybe one-time dividends and so on for this stock going forward. So 25 euro inception price. Uh, we think 40 euros is a fair. Uh, estimate uh, target price for for Kalmar. Uh, it's a two percent position in the fund currently. Right, and then uh, a position that ties into the value up program that I recently spoke about in in South Korea is Hyundai Mobis, and this is a misunderstood holding company trading in, in South Korea, which we think offers exceptional risk reward at the moment. The core business is uh, that it's an automotive supplier. But it's also a holding company that holds a 21% stake in the Hyundai Motor Group. And it's a very important building block for, for uh, in term, and among the different cross holdings in which the Shang family controls the Hyundai Motor Group. The core business uh, in, in Hyundai Mobis 
is that it's delivered critical automotive parts to Hyundai and Kia. And over the last years, it has diversified into delivering into other platforms as well. But the company has been pressured in terms of profitability for the core business as they have seen input cost inflation, pressure in EBIT margins, which we think is very likely to see a recovery going forward, in addition to boosted volumes, both from Hyundai Kia and other platform that has been coming on street. And we think that the, the, the market in general really underestimates this company's ability to, to generate cash, especially from the aftermarket part of the business. If you look at the balance sheet, which is very strong, they have a significant net cash position. And if you adjust it for the cross holding, we see core business here trading below one times its own cash flow. And looking at it from a historical perspective, this is historically cheap versus the cross holding at holds, which, which uh, you know, creates this very attractive risk reward, we, we believe. And then it ties very nicely into the value of program where we see the Hyundai Motor Group, of course, being somewhat under pressure, and we expect that in a potential restructuring, um, you know, the Mobis shareholders here would not be left uh, in an unfavorable position if you compare to what happened in 2018. So very interesting risk reward. This has now moved into the top 10 department of the fund, and it's a 3.8% position. Yeah, we talked about misunderstood equities in the beginning uh, on these con contrarian phenomena, and we think Acernox is a very good example of uh, exactly just that in terms of being a stainless steel producer listed in Spain, but their operations are mainly or <clears throat> even 80% of their operations, the revenues EBITDA is from the US and specialty steel market in, uh, do have done some acquisitions within that space. And the interesting thing is, if you look from a valuation perspective, that the US steel companies are trading roughly the double the multiple of European steel companies, where Acernox is trading currently. It's currently trading around three times <coughs> EV, EBTA, uh, which is very cheap, uh, around the levels of European steel, stainless steel company. But the US competitors, which we have listed here, are trading six to seven times EV, EBTA. And we think there's a structural EBTA <coughs> sorry, potential for the company to reach seven to 800 million euros in terms of earnings going forward. And this is a, uh, in, uh, we see an upset of over 80% uh, for Acernox reaching that kind of valuation levels in the midterm perspective. And this is a new at uh, 3.3% position, a top 10 position. And we have plenty of catalysts to come in there. For instance, a cyclical recovery in the European operation. If there were to, were to be a Trump win in the US, that would be a massive positive for this stock. That is not something that we need or count, but it would definitely be a good thing for this stock. And also, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, there are different carbon uh, adjustment mechanisms coming in into Europe, which will reduce the Chinese imports, which has been you know, plaguing in European steel market, stainless steel market as well. So there are plenty of catalysts for this, this case to, to re-rate. So uh, a very interesting risk reward in Acerinox, we, we think. Right, and then maybe lastly, we added Akatsuki, which is a small cap Japanese mobile game producer, and one of this is a really rare situations you can find in equity markets if you look uh, way below the radar. Uh, this this company is mostly famous for its uh, game called Dragon Ball. They have a huge IP library of manga related content. Dragon Ball has uh, so far reached 350 million downloads and they've been capitalizing for this game now for, for almost uh, 10 years and it's, it's still contributing quite nicely. Meanwhile, the company has built a significant net cash position, as you can see in the lower left corner of the chart. And uh, in addition to the net cash position, the company has even funded its all venture capital arm. And if you conservatively just look at the book value and take that combined with the net cash position, we have a negative enterprise value. So we are essentially uh, getting the entire core business in this company for free. Another aspect which is very interesting is that over the last years, the company has invested quite significantly in R&D 
uh, adding more game producers and are developing uh, new games that are supposed to be released over the coming two years. We have three major releases coming on stream, which the equity market is not paying any attention to, which we think is, is very interesting because they're, they're missing the fact of how much investment has been going into this and the normalized earnings potential uh, for a company like this, given that the, the asset base is, is just significantly more than what they produce uh, today. We also note that the company has recently received two new shareholders. We see Sony taking an almost 10% stake and Tecmo, which is a, a Nintendo related holding company taking an 8% stake. And this is of course very interesting at the, as it adds uh, you know, distribution capabilities uh, potentially for the new games. But we have also seen several cases in the market where we see takeout of studios like this um, with IP content like Akatsuki. So a very interesting mm -hmm. position we think at exceptionally cheap levels at 1.5% uh, currently in the fund. Yes, just looking at the portfolio highlights and you'll see that we have a price earnings ratio and a price book ratio way below you know, the general global equity market as you would suspect. You'll also see that elevated upside to our price target sitting at over 80% currently actually, which has not seen since the pandemic low. So that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, backdrop. And also if you look at the top 10 positions, you'll see that uh, we, we mentioned a few of these positions. If you turn to the next slide, uh, you'll see that um, we have uh, mentioned many of these names like uh, Cernox, like uh, Hyundai Mobis, K by KB Financials, and so on. Uh, First Horizon being the largest position in the fund. It's a US regional bank, uh, exceptionally well run, uh, low CRE exposure. Uh, we think lower rates might reduce deposit cost pressures. Uh, it's, con it's definitely a consolidation candidate. So it's an interesting name. And importantly, 39%, almost 40% of the fund is incepted less than a year ago. So it's a very fresh portfolio. So it's setting us up for a very nice upside, we think, of the next year or two years or three years, which is our investment uh, horizon. So. This is how it looks, 0.7, 70% uh, of book value and 10 times PE. And also just want to highlight that uh, we, uh, since we hadn't had a webinar for quite some time, we uh, did actually receive an award. Um, there was This was in the spring for being the best global small mid cap fund uh, that was in, in several different countries actually. Uh, so that was nice uh, and sort of it's a testament for that you can actually produce some very interesting returns in being different and being a contrarian um, value investor. So I think we, we're going to stop there and, and, and just um, on the summary um, slide, I think we mentioned all these um, these uh, things, of course, and we may be at that point where it's finally the return to small caps. Is the balance finally turning also value, of course. So I think the, the timing is clearly quite quite interesting here, but we'll stop there and see if there's any questions.